It's time to get inside the Giants' home. Let's go, let's go, let's go. On Giants.com. I like it, I like it, I like it. And like the it. Giants' mobile app. Boom. Give me some juice. Part of the Giants' podcast network. Let's roll. Welcome to another edition of the Giants' Huddle Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. I've been reading our guest's work today for a very long time. He does a fantastic job, and I'm thrilled to finally have him on the show. He's the author of many of football almanacs. The 2024 version is out. He is Aaron Schatz, the creator of DVOA and of a lot of other awesome metrics that we now use in the analytics world of the National Football League. Aaron, welcome to the Giants Little Podcast. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I should point out one of the authors. There's a lot of folks who write for the right. Football Almanac. I'm the editor and I do all the numbers and the projections, but there's some great writers too, like Mike Tanier and Brian Knowles and Scott Spratt and Dan Pizzuta and just a, a whole lineage of good people. Yeah, and uh, I always talk to Mike, uh, Mike Tanier. I think he wrote the Giants chapter, uh, actually. He did write and, this year's Giants chapter, yeah. Yeah, and, and I always chat with him. He always goes out to the combine every year. We always have good conversations when he's out there. Uh, all right, Aaron, so first of all, tell the people about the book, uh, where they can find that, and then also where they can find DVOA, and then we'll kind of get into what that means for people. Yeah, sure. You can find our book, uh, either the physical book with Trey, Travis Kelsey on the cover is at FTN, uh, is at, sorry, as Amazon. Search for FTN Football Almanac at Amazon 2024. Uh, or if you go to FTNFantasy.com slash almanac, you can get the online PDF version. Now you get a discount on the PDF version if you are a subscriber to FTN. And being a subscriber to FTN gets you all of the DVOA splits during the season, all the player DVOA and DYAR stats during the season, plus our new stats hub, which is going to be really awesome. We're going to have updated DVOA during the season with charting uh, filters. So you can get like, for example, which teams play the most man coverage, who has the best DVOA in man coverage, Ooh. who has the best DVOA against blitzes, like all kinds of stuff. It's going to be updated weekly during the season. Okay. I will subscribe to that folks. That is invaluable. Um, all right, Aaron. So let's start here. I want to start with the basics before we get into giant specific stuff. I always reference DVOA. I talk to fans about it. I think it's one of the best metrics to use in terms of determining how well an offense and defense is playing. So why don't you explain for fans, without getting into too too much math, how you put it together and what makes it superior to maybe some of the traditional stats that fans might normally use to, to figure out what they think might be a good offense or a good defense base? Sure. Simple version is it gives success on every play based on the down and distance, right? Three yards on second and one, good. Three yards on third and 10, bad. Uh, compares it to a league average baseline, which is adjusted for situation and opponent. And it's tweaked to specifically be predictive. So one of the reasons why it's really good is that it judges for context. It tries to filter out context. It tries to filter out some of the things that are more random, like fumble recoveries, or, you know, it doesn't count field goals against you. Like, I mean, like when you look at the score, it counts things like, you know, you have no control over how many field goals the other team kicks against you. Unless you block it, you have no control if that thing's going through or not. Right. So uh, it filters out things like that and gives you a better idea that can then be split into different, like which teams are best on first, second, and third down, or which teams are best in the red zone. And we know that certain things regress from mean, uh, regress to the mean from year to year, which gives us more ability to predict the future. So that's DVOA does all those things. So for you, what are the things that you consider the most random that, that you like to filter out? And then what, aspects of a team's offense to you are most predictive and which ones are least predictive? Well, one that I just mentioned is opposing special teams, right? For example, you have no control over the opposing kickoff distance, although everything with kickoffs gets different this year. <laughs> and no control over opposing field goals. The Giants actually last year had the league's best luck on opposing field goals with opposing kickers missing seven field goals, one of which was blocked, so the Giants do have control over that, and four extra points. And they're not going to be that lucky this year. Uh, things like fumble recovery, uh, things like the fact that turnovers in general are just more random than yards. Like, yards per play allowed are more predictive of the future over than takeaways. Which, by the way, given the Giants led the league in takeaways last year, that could also be significant. That is a little bit. That is a little bit significant. So, um, 
Although if you look at takeaways per drive, they were not, it, they, they had a lot of drives against them, which is why they had a lot of takeaways, but takeaways per drive, they were something like 10, which also will regress a little bit, but not quite as much. That's what happens um, when your offense is punting all the time, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> right. So um, third, uh, red zone performance is another one that's interesting. So red zone performance tends to regress over time towards your overall performance, which I've always thought was a really interesting conundrum for coaches. Let's say you're a coach and you believe in analytics, and I go to you and I say red zone performance is much less stable than other performance. Does that mean that, A, you should practice the red zone less because it's less stable and therefore you're not going to ever perfect it, so just accept that it's less stable and practice other plays? Or do you practice the red zone more mm -hmm. and try to basically beat the unstableness? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a really interesting question for a coach who's faced with what analytics has discovered over the last 20 years. How about third downs, Aaron? Uh, because obviously also know... a little bit more, although it's not when we first started, we thought third downs were very inconsistent. It turns out that on offense in particular, they're more consistent than we originally thought, but not as consistent as overall performance. So a team that's really good on first and second and bad on third will tend to improve the next year. And here's another negative for the Giants. The Giants last year on defense, 27th on first, 18th on second, and fourth on third. That's going to tend to regress from year to year. Yeah. So, And by the way, red zone and third downs, as you well know, those are two of the things that teams really do focus on in, their, in practice. So I think the way they're taking it is, all right, more randomness to it, right? So right, but we can beat the randomness, more. right? The way coaches would tend to think, I think, is we can beat the randomness by just right. practicing this more. And I don't know, by the way, I have no idea if they're right or if they're wrong. I'm not going to criticize them for it. No, absolutely not. And then those plays are obviously some of the most important, especially the red zone. But that's going to oh yeah, hugely important. But that's the so. thing is that the since the results of third downs and red zones vary more widely, and they're really important, like the results that teams have are very dependent on those situations, which are less consistent. Absolutely. So that makes it harder to predict the future. A couple other things I want to touch on here before we get to the Giants specifically. We, we know how it's now a passing league, and passing is much more predictive of scoring and success than, than rushing is. How important is rushing DVOA, Aaron, to a team's overall success? And how much specifically does it impact red zone success? Because it is hard to pass in the red zone. There's less space. You feel like you should be able to run better in there. It becomes more important. So how does rushing DVO affect generally how you evaluate these teams? I don't think red zone as much as I think short yardage. Okay. If I ran a team, what would be most important to me about the running game would be getting it right in short yard, would be being the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Like that is the one place where rushing is more efficient than passing is short yardage, one or two yards to go. And I would want to be really good running the ball in those situations. Otherwise, it is very rare for a good offense to be more efficient running the ball than passing the ball. For bad offenses, they are often more efficient running the ball than passing the ball because their passing is so negative. Right. But it is very rare for a good offense to be more efficient running. All right, true or false, two of the most important parts to being a high-scoring offense is limiting sacks and explosive plays. Yes, very true. Although, again, explosive plays, I don't think quite have the consistency of consistently moving the chains. Our DVOA is a little biased, I think, towards moving the change rather than explosive plays, in part because explosive plays are often... Uh, all the same, no matter how explosive they are. In other words, uh, the difference between a 50-yard touchdown pass and a 70-yard touchdown pass is often just what was the line of scrimmage. Right. Right? That 50-yard touchdown pass often would be a 70-yard touchdown pass if the dude had just started 20 yards earlier, right? So we lessen, as as the yardage goes up, we lessen the value of the plays a little bit 
And so that ends up biasing things. I think properly biasing things a little bit more towards the ability to move the chains being more predictive than the ability to get explosive plays. But explosive plays are hugely important and preventing sacks. You do not want to be in second and 18. And by the way, that's a hidden thing that we don't talk about much is the yardage on the sack. You don't want to be in second and 18. But if you had to choose, you would rather be in second and 12 than second and 18. Those are both sacks. You got sacked on first down both times. But second and 12 is an easier down than second and 18. And I imagine you're a, a big adherent to, even though obviously better to be in third and four than third and eight, it's much better to probably try to avoid being in third down at all rather right? than trying to get the yeah. first down on first or second down. Mike Lombardi used this term once, and I really like it. You want to have a CFL mindset. There are no third downs. Oh, I like that. A CFL mindset is the only third down is third and one. Everything else you want, you want to convert in two downs. Unless you can get to third and one, you want to convert in two downs. That's very good. I love it. Football season is coming, and so is the next college semester. If you need funding, a citizen student loan could help you pay for 100% of your school certified costs. Get your rate quote in about two minutes at citizensbank.com slash pay for college. You know, Aaron, uh, reading through your Giants chapter, understandably so. You guys are a little rough on the performance last year, especially offensively. And if you watch the games, I understand why he would be. Uh, the, the metrics aren't great. They had trouble scoring a lot of points. Uh, three different quarterbacks. The offensive line was banged up to all hell. Couldn't protect early in the season specifically. But you do put a kind of little of a window together for how the team can turn it around and be better this year. Before we get there, some of the offseason stuff. Overall thoughts on deciding to let Saquon Barkley go and use that money elsewhere. Two things I'm going to start off with. First is I have not watched Hard Knock. So I will be honest about that. Second is, uh, I am more of a fan of Joe Shane and Brian Dable than Mike is, who wrote the chapter. I look at the things that Joe Shane has done, and I feel like a lot of them made sense individually, and they just have not worked out in the collective. And Dable, I voted for coach of the year two years ago. And I don't think he suddenly forgot how to coach last year. I think that... There, there's a there's a real talent discrepancy with this team, but I think Dable is a better coach than I think Mike believes that he is. Um, I think letting Saquon Barkley go made total sense. Uh, the fact is, second running back contracts are almost always a bad idea. There are a few running backs who move the needle, but very few really do. Barkley might be one of those, but do you really want to pay through the nose in order to find out if he is, especially given where the Giants are on the, you know, the curve of how you build a team, like on the team building curve. I mean, Philadelphia, we'll get to this a little later, I think. Philadelphia is not as high up on the team building curve as I think people believe they are right now. But I understand that in their minds, they're getting, they are Super Bowl contenders. So let's add a, let's add a top running back who can really be active in our receiving game. The Giants are not at that point. So they they need to be spending their money on things like edge rushers, not, you know, something that's a bit of a luxury item, which is a second contract running. And by the way, I was going to touch on Burns when we got to the defense, but since you brought it up, what are your overall thoughts when you talk about team building, Aaron? I think you just made the point you want to get edge rushers premium position, right? What are your thoughts on having to use draft capital in addition to, to spending big money on a contract for acquiring a guy like that. I'm always one that's hesitant to do that, but yes. I also understand for a position like edge, generally you can't acquire those guys in free agency. You either have to draft them really high. So what are your thoughts on, on the process and how they went about trying to get Brian Burns? Yeah. And the same thing goes for Montez sweat with the Chicago bears. It, I, I understand the idea. It's still, I'm really, I'm not really positive on, using draft capital and then giving a top level contract. That is a lot of capital to spend. When you use draft capital on a position and then you give a top level contract, the only way that that player can be worth what you spent on him is if he is one of the top players at his position. And I don't mean Brian Burns can be a top 15 edge rusher. 
I mean, Brian Burns is only worth it if he is a top five edge rusher. Nick Bosa, Michael Parsons, that level of player. Yeah, and the yeah. fact is Burns is not in that class or has not been previously in that class. He's a little bit below that class. Not, you know, that is not to criticize him as a player. He's a very good player. Um, But only a couple of guys can be the top couple guys, right? That's how top couple guys works. And, I mean... You, this is not as bad as giving up draft capital and a major contract for a strong safety like <laughs> Seattle did when they traded for Jamal Adams, which everyone in the analytics world completely destroyed them for. But it is a when you give that contract and the draft capital, it's tough. That's why a lot of players who get traded don't get traded for as much draft capital as you would expect. Because if you're going to have to give them that cop contract too, you don't want to give up a first round pick for Brandon Ayuk. Right, because you can say, all right, well, if you don't make that trade or acquire that player, you can then spend that money on one or two other players, and then you get the draft pick too, which would be a top of the second round player. So right. theoretically, you, you know, you could get a you know multiple guys. And I know people use that family guy meme of sure we have a boat, but that box could be anything, even a boat. <laughs> but with a draft pick, that's not what it is. With a draft pick, it's sure we have an expensive boat. But that box could be anything, even a cheap boat. Like, yes, you're asking with a draft pick to get the same as the really good player, but you'd be getting that for much cheaper. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? All right, since we're on the defense, why, why, why don't we stick with this? When you look at teams and their defensive DVOA, the Giants have clearly made the bet that we're going to create a very good defensive front here, right? Pay Dexter Lawrence. We talked about the Burns transaction. Drafted to Kayvon Thibodeau in the top 10 three years ago. They're betting on their defensive front to carry this defense with a very young secondary. Yeah, and man, can, I, can I just say, does Kayvon Thibodeau get a little bit more crap than he deserves or what? I think he does. Um especially after a year where he had double digit sacks. And I know his pressure rate and stuff like that maybe didn't coincide with the sack number, but I can yeah, tell you, watch him. 54 and, and... pressures. Yeah. Now he yeah. had a really good season and he gets a lot of nonsense. No, Sorry I agree. Interrupt. And by the way, he even looks better in, he, 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 had, he had his way with Taylor Decker against the Lions in, in practice this past week. So he's, he's even looked better, to be honest with you. So sorry, go on with what you were saying about the Yeah, yeah, no game. problem. It's okay. Um, when when you take a look at successfully building successful defenses and what impacts defensive DVOA the most, is investing in your defensive front usually the best way to maximize your effectiveness? I don't have an answer to that. Okay. I don't have an answer to that because, I mean, some defenses are built from the secondary more than the front. And some defense, you know, like the, the Legion of Boom, or the current Jets. I mean, the Jets have good stuff in the front, but I mean, they have Ahmad Gardner and DJ Reed and Michael Carter, who's very underrated. Um, and some defenses are built from the lines out. I mean, I guess I'd prefer the lines out, but I don't, I can't tell you I've done research and it's better to build from the lines out than to build from the secondary. What I can tell you is that the analytics has shown pretty good that what you don't build is from the linebackers. That off-ball linebacker is just a less important position. And yes, there are a couple of off-ball linebackers, just like there are, is a Christian McCaffrey. There is also a Roquan Smith, right? There are a couple of off-ball linebackers that are transcendent, but for the most part, those guys are more replaceable. So that's not where you start building. Fair enough. How about young secondaries? Is that a dangerous thing to roll out there for your defense? Because the Giants right now, uh, their slot guy could be a rookie. Their one outside cornerback could be a third-year guy. Uh, they have a second-year player and a rookie competing for a safety spot next to Jason Pinnock, who, by the way, is just a one-year starter at the position. Deontay Banks is a second-year player, their best corner. What does what history and DVOA tell you about putting out a, a largely young secondary? I have never seen any evidence okay. that that is a particularly bad move. I will say you do expect rookies to struggle more than players at other positions, but by the time you get to like year two, I don't think you expect that anymore. And secondary play is just pretty inconsistent. 
So it's not like rookies come in and all suck. Like some of them are very good as rookies. So look, you have situations like Tyreek Stevenson in Chicago last year where he was horrendous for the first half of the year and then above average for the second half of the year. Like cornerback play is just very inconsistent. So I've never seen any evidence that specifically being young at cornerback is a problem. Well, I, well, let me follow up then because I agree with you. I do think coverage from year to year, and I think you know, in some of the stuff. No that, matter how that, you measure it, by the way, right? Yeah, because I mean, starting if you look staff, PFF grades from PFF year to year, grade, a lot just too. anecdotally, it's just the most inconsistent position, which is tough because it is a very important. It is a very important, but inconsistent and hard to predict position. So, with that said, then I'm going to go back to a previous question. You might not have the data, but then anecdotally, does it make more sense then to put your investment? up front on defense because that is less inconsistent and less volatile and more predictable. Yeah, that would be a reasonable, uh, that would be a reasonable argument for why you should build from the line out rather than from the secondary in is that yes, is that uh, I don't know about safety play per se, but uh, right. cornerback play is much more inconsistent when you have a, the odds that, Brian Burns will be mediocre this year are much lower than the odds that Ahmad Gardner will be mediocre this year because Patrick Sertain was frankly mediocre last year. He was, I'm sorry, but he was like, that doesn't mean I don't think that when you look at like inherent skill, Patrick Sertain is one of the best cornerbacks in the league. And if I was to predict who was likely to be one of the best cornerbacks in the league this year, I would definitely predict Patrick Sertain. But he was mediocre last year, and you don't get that from top edge rushers. Miles Garrett doesn't suddenly finish 35th in pressures. No, right, 100%. The, maybe the biggest addition for the Giants on defense, aside from Burns, they change defensive coordinators. They bring Shane Bowen in from, from Tennessee. Uh, what is some of the history with, with what he did in, in, in Tennessee, Aaron, stand out to you in terms of what Giant fans should look for with Bowen arriving and installing his defense, which is very different than what Wing Martindale had here previously? Uh, yeah, they will blitz a lot less. The Titans last year were sixth in how often they rushed four. And they were fifth in the percentage of sacks that came from edge rushers. So they're going to play more zone. And they're going to leave their cornerbacks on sides. And they're going to rush only four. And they were an average defense last year. So I, you know, I don't, I'm not like, woo, Shane Bowen, but it's not like, oh, Shane Bowen's history is that he sucks. Like it's not either of those things. Now I will ask you this because he does have a very good history too of, of defending the run. Well, for you, when you look at this from year to year is, is run defense more personnel based? Is it simply how many guys you have in the box? Is it a numbers game? Is it a how lot of it is a numbers game. That's not a year to year thing. If you look at run if you look at the efficiency of runs, a lot of it depends on just how many men are in the box. That's it. Like the best way to play defense is if your back four are good enough that you can have seven men in the box all the time. Because then right. you can stop the run more. If you can stop the pass that way, you can stop the run more. So, yeah, it matters a lot how many men are in the box. And I got to imagine with as teams go to more of this split safety defense stuff and they try to have two safeties deep all the time. That's why I think a lot of this power running game, you see the Rams going to more duo type of stuff in the running game. NFL is cyclical, and, baby. You know, everything, 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 everything goes everything back to what cyclical. it was before. Yeah. No, go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, I was going to say just NFL is cyclical, right? Like the run will be on the rise and then deep safeties will come in and then the run will drop and the safeties will move back. And that's just the NFL is cyclical. It really is. It's amazing. And you, know, you went from the Bears back in the day, you had all those cover two defenses, and then teams started running. So what did they do? Oh, then you had a Legion of Boom cover three stuff come in. Now everyone's starting to throw. Oh, well, it, it's 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 funny how it always goes back and forth. All right, let's jump back to the offensive side of the ball here, Aaron. You mentioned you thought Brian Dable, and you voted for him for in Coach of the Year in 2022. And you take a look at how that Giants offense functioned frankly, at a higher level than they probably should have given the personnel they had that year. Um, what is it about that offense that year that stood out to you? And do you think it's replicable in some way, shape, or form? Do you want to replicate it? Just how do you view 2022 and then try to you know use that as a, as a mirror? They got kind of guys the open. They had injuries, a lot of injuries, wide receiver, and yet Dable was able to get guys open, and Jones was at the top of his game. 2022 was a best-case scenario on offense. Like I mean, the only way it could have been a better-case scenario would have been if they had fewer wide receiver injuries. But 
Like Jones played about as well as he can play, and Debo coached about as well as he can coach. So let me follow up then. This, this is one thing we talk about here is how a quarterback success is often driven by the pieces around him, right? And, you know, obviously their own talent, uh, you know, especially the elite guys like an Allen Mahomes, they can succeed regardless of what's around. Them. That's what makes them special, right? How much, though, can uh, improvement in the weapons you're throwing to and the offensive line in front of you impact a quarterback's performance? I mean, it does absolutely impact the quarterback's performance. There's no question about it. That being said, I do feel like this is a theory, not something I've proven with research, but I feel like no matter how good the quarterback is, wide receiver one usually gets his. It's two and three that suffer when the quarterback is worse, and I think it's two and three that matter more to the quarterback's performance. I mean, yes, there are examples like Stephon Diggs. All of a sudden, that was the year Josh Allen took a big step forward. But I think when I look at the Giants this year, I think to myself, well, if Neighbors is as good as we think he is, there's wide receiver one, but what else is there? Right? So, like, wide receiver one will get his, but is there enough other receivers to – get Jones to improve Jones's pr production. Yeah. And I think they're counting on two young guys. And I know you, I think there's well, Jalen Hyatt and Robinson who, who you guys do talk yeah. about. And the one thing I know you guys don't like about Robinson, I think it was his um, yards per catch, right. And how, how far downfield he's catching passes. Correct. Yeah. He's one of those little guys that does the little slot things. Yeah. That's what he is. How about a guy like Hyatt, who was a big downfield threat in college, obviously had a, had a slow go his rookie year. How how much can a guy, especially a, a, a wide receiver, take a jump after that rookie year? And then how predictive is that rookie year, even if it's not that productive, be in terms of what that second year can look like? What was interesting to me is, so last year I introduced a new thing called root DVOA, right? DVOA for receivers has always been based on targets because we didn't have data on roots run. And over the last few years, research has shown that can, are, uh, stats that are based on roots run are more consistent and more predictive. So last year I created for the first time, thanks to the FTN charting data, a DVOA based on, based on roots run. We gave both of them in the book because uh, you can't use the root one to compare to the past because we only have it for three years. Mm -hmm. I have the other one going back to 1979. Um, Hyatt did really bad. He just wasn't drawing targets. And I would have to go back and watch the film to answer the question, is Hyatt not getting open or is it just that their quarterbacks just could not get the ball downfield to him? But it was kind of shocking to me how much he was ignored in that offense when he was on the field. So that has got to change this year. That's got to change. Yeah, and look, we talked about the importance of explosive plays earlier. He's obviously one of the guys you would hope – um, could bring some of those explosive plays. Right. Uh, you mentioned neighbors. He's looked great in camp. What kind of impact can getting a number one wide receiver have, not just on the quarterback, but also on the other wide receivers in the group? Because as you know, they've been basically rolling out Darius Slayton, who's done as well as you could ask him to do over the past three years as a number one, but he's just, you know, not equipped to be that guy. You think neighbors is. So what kind of impact could a guy like neighbors have uh, on this offense, the quarterback and the other receivers? I mean, theoretically, it should help, right? Because he'll draw coverage and that will get two and three open more often. And that will make things better for the quarterback. Now, I'm going to tell you two things that will seem contradictory. Number one. In our playmaker score projections, Malik Neighbors was the number one receiver in this class, higher than Marvin Harrison. And the main reason was that he was so good while sharing the ball with Brian Thomas. It matters that Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors were so good, even though they had to deal with each other. And therefore, Neighbors and Thomas were our top two receivers of the year. On the other hand, I've talked about this a little bit on podcasts having to do with Arizona and Chicago as well. I've discovered this weird trend. All other things being equal, teams that draft a wide receiver or tight end high in the draft tend to drop a little bit in offense and then go up in year two. And it sounds weird. And we certainly can remember anecdotally a couple of rookie wide receivers who lifted their team's offenses like Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase. But overall, 
And I'm not blaming it on the rookie wide receiver. I'm just saying rookie wide receivers who are drafted high tend to be drafted into situations where that offense, for some reason, is, you know, maybe it's because they got rid of a veteran in order to bring in the rookie and the rookie's not as good at first. But whatever, these teams tend to drop a little bit in offense in the first year and then go up when those receivers and tight ends are in their second year. So that is something that does play in our projections for teams like the Giants, the Cardinals, and the Bears. That is interesting. I, 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 I would, that, that is interesting data. I wouldn't think that, but I, I like that. You may you, you might have already answered this already with your yards per route want run answer. Um, how do you predict and what do you look at when predicting whether or not a wide receiver is going to make a jump from year to year? whether it's because you might get more targets, maybe somebody leaves. What are some of the things you look like? Yeah, you look I mean, at honestly, there's no, I wouldn't say there's any statistical flag that goes, that's it. That's the thing. You want to look for two things. One, were they efficient with fewer targets? And two, what's the opportunity? Mm. Neighbors is walking in with the opportunity to be number one. Harrison is walking in with the opportunity to be number one. Adunze doesn't have that, Right. So you naturally expect more from neighbors and Harrison than you do from a dude. I want to put the last question on, on, on 2022. And then I want to get to the offensive line real quick. Um, when you look at 2022, so much of that, I think DVOA and efficiency for the giants offense had to do with the quarterback running the ball, right? Uh, Daniel Jones's ability to scramble and the scramble can oftentimes be one of the most efficient plays yes. um, it, yes. it, in the NFL. Can you just put in context for giant fans? I'm not sure if some of them appreciate it necessarily, how good Daniel Jones is as a runner and how much he really did help that offense as a runner back in 2022. Uh, let me see if I can find numbers for what he did back in 2022. Hold on a second. Yeah, no problem. Uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, 217 rushing DYAR, which I don't have the rank here, but that's gotta be the top of the league or close to it. He was a very efficient runner in 2022. Now, he was not in 2021, and he was not in 2023. But he was very, very efficient in 2022. So having that, listen, there was a year that the Bears, where Mitch Trubisky was a really good runner, and it really helped the Bears overall, even though we know Mitch Trubisky was really is really lacking as a quarterback. So absolutely, that helps. That's something to keep an eye on this year, coming off that ACL for sure. We talk about the receiver. The other thing that can help a quarterback, obviously, Aaron, is the offensive line. And the Giants' offensive line, except for 2022 when they were, I think, functional, uh, they've been darn close to non-functional for a lot of the other years in, in the past three or four seasons. Uh, they brought in Carmen Brasillo, a new offensive line coach. They've brought in two or three vets that have had some level of success in the past that you think can at least – bring the level of the offensive line up a little bit. So I got a couple questions here. I'll start with this. How much can a change in offensive line coach impact a unit like that as a whole in trying to get them back towards average? I don't know the answer to that, but my guess is that it does have an impact. Certainly Bill Callahan has had an impact. I don't yeah. know anything about this dude, but Bill Callahan has absolutely had inf- impact on offensive lines. Dante Scarnecchia impact Dante on offensive Scarnec- line. Me- it's hard to measure the impact of Dante Scarnecchia because he was always there. Right. Yeah, Dante Scarnecchia obviously is. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about putting position coaches in the Hall of Fame with Bill Callahan and Dante Scarnecchia, are start at start the top of the list, honestly. I'm with you. All right, so now let's talk about offensive line performance in general. A lot of people will say that it's kind of like a weak link position, right, where yeah. you can have three or four really good players, you have one bad one, that – that can sink you. There are two bad ones, especially. You can't really help two guys. You can only kind of help one on any given play. Is that how you view the offensive line, too, when you're trying to put it together? Better to have, like, five average guys than two great guys and then two bad ones? Yes. Yes. If you if your offensive line, if you were to rank the offensive line from one to five, you would rather have all threes than three fives but two ones. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? Yes. Makes sense. At what point when you look, and I don't know what, I actually don't know what metrics you use to 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 kind of it's judge hard, offensive man. line. Play. I mean, I, I like the ESPN pass block win rates. 
Um, you know, looking at pressures allowed is good, uh, but pressures, you know, pressures are, are somewhat caused by the quarterback. So the offensive line is a hard, is a hard uh, position to judge with stats. So maybe you don't have to put a number on it then maybe a ranking based on whatever metric, you know, fans want to use. What's the area you want to stay out of if you're a team to keep, just make your offense able to function like a normal offense. You know, what is, is it bottom quartile? Is it bottom fifth? What, like how less bad do you have to be? Well, it's offensive line really not. Yeah, see, I don't believe offense. in defining lines like that. Like okay. everything is gradual. And the other thing is the offensive line plays more of a role in run blocking than pass blocking, right? Quarterbacks have a lot more to do with their own sacks and pressures. Sure. Running backs have less to do with their yards per carry. Now, the problem with the Giants is they were bad in every area last year. Last year, the Giants were last in adjusted line yards, which is run blocking. They were last in adjusted sack rate and last in pressure rate allowed. But I feel like the line themselves has more control over the adjusted line yards. So that's kind of what I would look to improve first. And I would look to improve how the quarterback takes pressures and sacks for pass blocking. And now, generally speaking, quarterback more control over sack rate than pressure rate, correct? Yes, but more but more control over pressure rate than you think. Would has you say control the, over both, but more over sacks, yes. Would you say the quarterback or the offensive line has more control over pressure rate? Probably still the quarterback. Wow, okay. But I would say sack rate is probably something like 80-20, and pressure rate is probably something like 60-40 or 55-45. So when you talk about quarterback controlling pressure rate, Aaron, that's more recognizing when he has to get the ball out quickly before the pressure can get there, pre-snap, doing those types of things? Yes. Yes. Interesting. Obviously, which... If you're watching the game, it's 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 really kind of hard to figure out whether or not they're doing that right or not. You kind of just have to look at the results in that way. And yeah, even when we that, chart, right? if we chart pressures allowed, we don't chart pressure allowed because the quarterback held on to it long. We chart pressure allowed. So teams where quarterback, like uh, last year, let me look. At, I'm looking at the numbers here. Ben Bredesen, 37 pressures allowed. Some of that is on the quarterbacks, man. Sure. Some of those are pressures. There's no question. I mean, is Ben Bredesen as good as Creed Humphrey? No. If Patrick Mahomes was back there, would Ben Bredesen have allowed 37 pressures by FTN data charting? No. <laughs> no, and, 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 and I think that's absolutely fair. How valuable do you consider the average time to throw metric in determining how well quarterbacks can control that pressure rate? I don't know. But a lot of time to throw is scheme more than quarterback. Scrambling has has, has obviously a, a, a quarterback that's trying to buy time with their legs is going to have a much longer. Right. So some of it is the scheme and some of it is who the quarterback is. And does he like to scramble and does he like to hold on to the ball? And yeah, there's a lot of variables that go into that. But I would imagine, and again, if you don't have the data, uh, we could just talk anecdotally, I suppose. If a quarterback has a very high pressure rate, but their average time to throw is you know pretty low, that would probably point towards more offensive line problem than quarterback problem, correct? Probably. Fair enough. Probably. All right. Let's take a look at the NFC East a little bit here, Aaron, because I do think it's an interesting division. Um, the Eagles are a weird team. I think we like their talent, but they are relying on a lot of younger players now when they weren't before. And we saw they collapsed at the end of last year. So why don't we start with Philly? How do you view Philly this year uh, in, in terms of team that has two brand new coordinators? And I think they are making a bit of a transition from some of their older talent to some younger players. I'm lower on the Eagles than the market because they were something like ninth or 10th in DVOA, even when they were nine and one. And then they collapsed over the second half of the season. They were barely an above average team last year. And I don't see a lot of reasons to believe that they are suddenly going to rebound to be a top five team and a Super Bowl contender. I think that people are underestimating the loss of Jason Kelsey. In particular, it would not surprise me if the tush push did not work as well this year. And that would be a big change for that team. So I think that the Eagles are much more of a nine and eight type team than they are a 12 and five type team. What do you think of Jalen Hurts? 
I think he's good. How much of that is because of his ability to run, and how much of that is because of his ability to throw it? More his ability to run, but you know he's not a bad thrower. He he's an above average quarterback. I think. I, I I'm we're exactly on the same page. I'm with you. All right, how about the Cowboys? Uh, Twelve straight wins, three years in a row. Playoffs not so well. Um, you know, and and and, 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 and I know that probably talk. confuses analytics a little bit, right? Because you guys try to view playoff games and regular season games as the same, right? Right. I will fully cop to being a Dak believer. I will fully cop to, I believe that Dak Prescott is the best quarterback in the NFC. I think that Dak Prescott, I think one of these years is not going to get the yips in the playoffs and they are going to make it to the Super Bowl unless they don't resign him. In which case, unless it's this year, which I don't think it's going to be, it won't happen. I mean, it could be this year, right? You know, I mean, the, the the main reason why I have San Francisco so heavily favored is because there's less competition in the NFC than the AFC, but there is some competition in the NFC, and the Cowboys are some of that. I mean, I don't know what the deal is with the Cowboys in the playoffs. I don't know how real it is. History is filled with teams that couldn't do it in the playoffs until the year they did. The best right. example for me is the Colts. Right? The Colts couldn't get it done in the playoffs until suddenly in 2006, they did. Suddenly, they got it done in the playoffs. The Rams couldn't get it done in the playoffs in the 70s until in 79, they did. In other sports, uh, the Celtics, uh, the San Francisco Giants with Barry Bonds couldn't get it done in the playoffs until the year that they made it to the World Series. Like, history is filled with teams that had these strings of sucking in the playoffs, and then they had the year where they played as well in the playoffs as they did in the regular season. And I feel like there's a good chance that that will happen to Dallas one of these years. The problem is, first of all, given the way that they're treating signing their players, it better be this year. And second is they could have that happen and still lose. The Cowboys could finally play well in the playoffs and win two games and get to the NFC championship game and play well and lose by three points. And then everybody will just keep talking about how they can't get it done in the playoffs. So it's hard. The other thing is when you have one team win three championships in five years, it makes it so everybody else looks like they can't get over the hump. Right. Right. Because if you think about the last five years, we have Tampa, which is no longer part of the discussion and the Rams who are kind of part of the discussion and then three chiefs championships, which means the bills are a team that can't get over the hump. The Bengals are a team that can't get over the hump. Okay. The Ravens, the Cowboys, the Ravens, the 49ers, maybe the Lions. They're, they're all teams that can't get over. The, I mean, the Lions, it's only been one year, but they're all like teams that can't get over the hump because the Chiefs keep winning it. But one of those teams could get over. I don't think that all of those teams magically have something that makes them bad in the playoffs, other than the magic of Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you on that. And and this is a very simple way to put this question. And I apologize for it. Do you think you're a Dak believer? Are you a Dak believer where pay him 60 million and make him the highest paid quarterback? Yes. Okay. Good, good firm answer. I like that. If it was my choice. Yes. I, I wouldn't want to, but that, that's how quarterback salaries work. If you're a top five or six quarterback and you're the next guy up to get paid, I mean, if we wiped the slate now and we announced all quarterbacks were going to get paid based on how good they were, then I would say Dak would be the fifth, I don't know, fifth best quarterback, paid quarterback in the game. But that's not how contracts work. Yep. But and what I like really know is this. You can ask questions about whether Dak Prescott is not good in the playoffs. And you can be like, we're, we're not going to pay him because he's never going to get down in the playoffs and we need to move on. But you cannot ask those questions about Micah Parsons and C.D. Lamb. Why on earth have they not been paid yet? No, no, I, I think that's absolutely okay. And that's why you and, and I was going to say that's why you pay guys early, man. If you have a chance to pay guys early, you pay them early, and then you kind of go from there and you figure it out. I'm with you. And based then the, on TV um, away and the NFC. Team, just quickly, the third team is the Washington uh, Commanders. Yes. Oh, that's right. And, I, I, yeah. So how do you how do you see them? Be? I know a lot of people are bullish on them this year. I don't know if I can get past their offensive line and and, and their secondary where I think there are some issues. I'll summarize it. Yeah. Bad defense. With offense, the same thing that I've been saying about other teams with rookie quarterback. You cannot project that a rookie quarterback will be good. 
one of them will probably be really good. Yep. One of them will probably be really bad. The rest of them will probably be kind of bad. And I don't know which of those guys is Jaden Daniels and which of those guys is Caleb Williams and which of those guys is Anthony Richardson, who's effectively a rookie. And so I don't quite know what the Washington offense is going to be, but we don't project them to be good. I'm with you on that. Based on DVOA, NFC, maybe give me one or two teams you think might overachieve to where teams people might see them and maybe two or two teams they do think might underachieve. Well, the underachieve is Philly and Atlanta, where we really don't like their defense. The overachieve is very clear. I am the driver of the New Orleans Saints bandwagon. Boring is good again. We like Boring it. is average. Boring <laughs> is not good because they're not good. They are a boring team that has bored everybody into thinking they suck, when in reality, they are very average. They were 15th in DVOA last year. They lost their division on a tiebreaker. They are 15th in the DVOA projections. They are 15th on offense. They are 14th on defense. They are 12th in special teams. That is almost as average as you can possibly get. They are just phenomenally mediocre in a bad division with an easy schedule. I like it. All right, same question, AFC. Um, I think the team that we have lower than expectations the most is Indianapolis. And that's because I'm not buying that Richardson's going to be hugely good. And because they were not as good as their DVO, they, their DVOA was not as good as their record last year anyway. But Richardson could be good and absolutely prove me wrong. I don't know. You know, let me follow up on the Colts real quick before you, uh, before you switch to the other side of that question. Do you think it does help a quarterback to watch but not play and to be in the meetings and stuff like that? Every time we've done research on this, we get a very firm answer. And the answer is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And the uh, team that I like better than the market is the New England Patriots. I think that uh, provided that they do not trade Matt Judon, even with the blood clots for Bert Christian Barmore, I believe the New England Patriots will have a top five defense this year. And even though they have a very tough schedule and their offense is not good, I think their offense will be better because I think Jacoby Brissett will start most of the year. Yep. So it will be bad, but not horrendous. The quarterback is not going to be giving games away. And that defense is going to win games no one expects them to win. And they are going to go over their four and a half number in Vegas. How do you measure the impact of losing a guy like Belichick? Just from you the can't. defensive side of we the threw ball. In, I threw in an extra penalty that I've never thrown in for any team before for losing Belichick. And they still come out with a top five defense. Wow, really? They were ninth in defensive DVOA last year, despite being 30th in takeaways per drive and missing their best pass rusher and two of their three best cornerbacks yeah. for basically the entire season. It's going to be good this year. I like it. All right, Aaron, uh, anything else you want to add before we go? And if not, you can just tell the folks one more time where they can find all your stuff. Yeah, FTN Football Almanac 2024, man. It is the best preview of the season with the most accurate projections, award-winning fantasy projections from Jeff Radcliffe of FTN. Uh, chapters on every team by our writers, lots of writing. It's not just tables of stats. It's lots of writings that explain the stats. You get the book at ftnfantasy.com slash almanac, or you want to go to Amazon and search for FTN Football Almanac 2024. Make sure you get the one with Travis Kelsey on the cover, not Patrick Mahomes. That was last year. Aaron, wonderful. This was great. It was so much fun talking to you. Let's make this a yearly off-season tradition. It was great getting all the data and information from you. Thanks so much for the time, and enjoy the season, my friend. Yeah, good luck to the Giants. May I be wrong. <laughs> Aaron Chats, check out all his work. Thank you for joining us in the Giants Settle Podcast, everybody. Brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. We'll see you next time, everybody.